Tonight, Canada launches an investigation into the tragic loss of the Titanic tour sub. The search for accountability after the catastrophic implosion. This was avoidable and preventable. The warning signs and the questions that remain. Jailhouse rap. Facts. Man, you want to know some facts? The music video made inside an Ontario prison. I think it's rather embarrassing for the corrections people. Plus, pride and passion at the Special Olympics. Here I am. Living proof. Don't give up. The inspiring Canadian athletes putting on a powerful performance. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Reporting tonight, John Ehrlichman. Good evening. Teams of investigators from Canada and the U.S. are starting to gather information about what exactly led to the implosion of the Titan sub claiming the lives of five people. Its experimental approach using uncertified technology may have been a fatal mistake, according to the man who first discovered the Titanic's remains. We've made thousands and thousands and thousands of dives with other countries as well to these depths and have never had an incident. The debris field from the sub was found just 500 meters from the bow of the Titanic. CTV's John Vinavelli Rao is in St. John's tonight and starts us off. While several ships remain at the site of the wreckage, using robotic underwater vehicles to look for more debris, the Canadian vessel that was a submersible support ship, the Polar Prince, is now on its way back to St. John's. This has questions remain about what led to that catastrophic implosion that killed these five adventurers on a voyage to the Titanic. The only saving grace about that is that it would have been immediate, literally in milliseconds, and the men would have had no idea what was happening. As for the probe by Canada's Transportation Safety Board, it says a team of TSB investigators is traveling to St. John's to gather information, conduct interviews, and assess the occurrence. This is a Las Vegas man says he and his son were offered discounted tickets for the trip, posting text messages between himself and OceanGate CEO Stockton Rush, saying Rush wrote, while there's obviously risk, it's way safer than flying in a helicopter or even scuba diving. He drank his own Kool-Aid. He was passionate about it. It didn't come from a, a place of malice. It didn't come from a place of greed. He just, you know, had this vision, had this belief, and wanted the world to share it with him. Instead, their seats went to another father and son, Pakistani British businessman Shazada Dawood and 19-year-old Suleiman. In Pakistan, locals reeling from the loss, the pair were from one of the country's most prominent families. This man says the accident has shocked the entire nation. Rush had faced criticisms for using carbon fiber and titanium to build his experimental sub, which had never been certified. You know, sometimes people get go fever, but you shouldn't be using an experimental vehicle for, for paying passengers that aren't themselves deep ocean engineers. Though some defending Rush. He was very well aware of the risks of uh, operating at these deep depths, and he was very committed to safety. Experts say the force of the implosion would make recovering any human remains very unlikely. This, as the head of the Titanic International Society wrote in a statement, it is time to consider seriously whether human trips to Titanic's wreck should end in the name of safety, adding little is left to be learned about the wreck. As for that Canadian support ship, the Polar Prince, it's expected to arrive back here in St. John's early tomorrow morning. John. Okay, thanks very much, John. Canada's Air Force tonight identified the pilots killed in Tuesday's helicopter crash near Petawawa. Captain David Damagala of Woodstock, Ontario was a military reservist and Captain Marc LaRouche of Amos, Quebec was an experienced private and military pilot with deployments to Somalia. Both were killed during a nighttime training exercise when their Chinook helicopter slammed into the Ottawa River. The tragedy grounded Canada's fleet of Chinooks, but today the military said they'll return to service. As the war in Ukraine hit the 16-month mark, there are reports of serious infighting between Moscow and the head of Russia's private army. Evgeny Prigozhin of the Wagner mercenary group accused Russia's defense minister 
of ordering a rocket attack that killed many of his troops. Moscow then accused him of calling for an armed rebellion. Russia is now beefing up security in the capital and near its military headquarters in the south. Tech experts are warning about the spread of disinformation if social media giant Meta makes good on its plan to block the sharing of Canadian news content on its platforms. The owner of Facebook and Instagram is poised to cut the content as retaliation against Canada's newly passed Online News Act. Here's CTV's Annie Bergeron Oliver. Meta platforms made $116 billion in revenue last year, but the global tech giant says it shouldn't be forced to pay for Canadian news content shared on its platforms, and it's getting set to block news altogether. I think that's a blow to just citizens staying informed. I'm always on my phone, right? So yes, I do watch the news on social media most of the time. Zero impact. I don't watch the news. I have found many years ago that watching the news is very depressing. Meta says the move is a direct response to the government's latest bill, the Online this News bill, Act. Bill C-18 forces digital platforms exactly. like Meta and Google to negotiate and pay community newspapers, campus broadcasters and big media companies for content users share on their sites. We've seen way too many journalists laid off. It's time to stop the bleeding. It's time to start reinvesting in high quality content that Canadians want. And that's good for our democracy. We need informed citizens in this country and journalism plays an absolutely critical role in that. The changes to your Facebook and Instagram feeds could hit within the next few months. This tech expert fears misinformation will spread if verified news can't be shared. I would assume that if you were to put a link in, if the link is identified, it would probably be removed, similar to what they do with content that violates, let's say, community standards. But while advocates say the bill will help compensate Canadian journalists struggling with the changing media landscape, critics say the bill threatens to restrict access to the web. The law is a way of changing the ability of people to use the internet. That's precisely what it's intended to do. The bill may have passed, but the regulations won't come into force for about six months. And during that time, many experts believe Facebook will back off its threat, John, and sign deals with publishers big and small. All right. Thanks, Annie. Bell Media, which owns CTV, has asked the federal telecommunications regulator to reduce its local news requirements. The company says its stations are under financial strain and has asked the CRTC to lower the number of hours of mandated local news coverage. Bell Media says its news operations lost $40 million in revenue last year. Without changing how we operate to align with today's shifting consumer demands, these operating losses will only grow. The application was made last week on the same day Bell announced it was cutting 1,300 positions. Canada's largest city is preparing for one of its most anticipated events of the year, the Toronto Pride Parade. Millions are expected to turn out, but the celebrations will take place amid a rising tide of hate. Here's CTV's Heather Wright. Amid a backdrop of rising hate, Pride celebrations are set to get underway across the country. It's Pride and uh, we have to celebrate because we can. At its roots, Pride is protest sending a message as relevant today as it was at the first parade 42 years ago. We are here because we are proud to be who we are in daylight. Despite this rain here in Toronto, setup is well underway for this weekend's Pride Parade, one of the many cities across the country grappling with skyrocketing security costs. For this year's Toronto Pride, the cost of policing more than doubled, while the price of private security jumped 25%. For insurance, that cost ballooned from $67,000 last year to $300,000 this year. I strongly believe that as a result of the hate, as a result of our community being targeted by so many individuals. Despite decades of progress, anti-LGBTQ2S plus hate is again on the rise. In 2021, the number of police reported hate crimes related to sexual orientation jumped 64% compared to the previous year. As intolerance has become less hidden, it is more in the public eye. People are emboldened to attack our communities, our vulnerable populations, our trans people. Despite that, those gathering for Pride events don't necessarily say this year is more important. They say they need to show up every year and send a message. Representation is always important. Which is why some are disappointed in the NHL's decision to drop all themed warm-up jerseys next season. 
which include pride jerseys. Last season, a number of players refused to wear the rainbow on their jerseys, citing religious or political reasons. And the league says the theme nights were being undermined by the controversy. I think it's just a cowardly move. It's shameful in so many ways to, to cave into the few um, that have bigoted ways of thinking um, and the hatred behind it. And so with extra security, thousands will take to the streets this weekend, celebrating a community that says it will keep fighting for equality. Heather Wright, CTV News, Toronto. Unbridled hatred is what separated a Yazidi family in 2014 when their community was attacked by ISIS in Iraq. Today, after nearly a decade apart, it was love that brought them back together. After years not knowing if they were alive, Khalil and Faneh Zandinan were back under the same roof as their children who'd been in a German refugee camp. Today was the end of a painful ordeal navigating Canada's immigration system, an experience those who helped the family say wasn't necessary. It shouldn't be a four-year process. It shouldn't be a six-year process. Not when you're talking about families who are separated. The family hopes by sharing their story, the government will start expediting reunifications for Yazidi families. A Syrian human rights activist now living in Toronto risked her life fighting for democratic change in her home country. But while in the process of making Canada her permanent home, she found out she's being flagged as a national security risk. CTV's Judy Tren reports. Noura al Jazawi, a wife and mother who took on a dictator. In 2011, as a student, Al Jazawi led protests against Syrian President Bashar al-Assad and fought for women's rights. She was arrested for speaking out and repeatedly abused in prison with electric shocks. I survived the detention in Syria many times, three times. I survived the torture, physical torture, psychological torture. Her testimony is crucial to a case at the International Court of Justice. Canada and the Netherlands want to hold the Syrian regime accountable for atrocities during its civil war. I made it very clear to them that I'm risking everything because of justice. I will fight until the last moment of my life for justice, for accountability, and to protect the others who I left behind. Despite her human rights work, Canadian immigration officials flagged Al Jazawi as a national security risk. She doesn't know why. To get answers, her lawyer is suing the government in federal court. What exactly are the specifics? Because when you look at Section 34, it could be espionage, it could be subversion of any uh, force by, of any government, it could be danger to the security of Canada. After more than a decade in exile, Al Jazawi was hoping to make Canada her permanent home. But now her supporters worry that she could be detained or deported. At this point, I can say her greatest threat is the Canadian government. Because their inaction is leading to fear, it's leading to her feeling a lack of safety. The Canada Border Services Agency says it reviews all relevant factors before taking action. Al Jazawi has been waiting for her application to be processed for three years. With this security question still hanging, her life remains in limbo. Judy Trin, CTV News, Ottawa. Traffic is moving again today on a major highway in Philadelphia less than two weeks after a deadly collapse. <laughs> There were fears Interstate 95 would be shut down much longer, but workers built a temporary roadway that will be used while a permanent bridge is constructed. A section of the highway collapsed when a tractor trailer carrying gasoline caught fire, killing the driver. Coming up after the break. Making a music video in jail while awaiting a murder trial. Plus, the classrooms where cursive writing makes its return. More communities in Quebec are under new evacuation orders tonight after smoke from one of the dozens of fires burning in the province became too thick to handle. One Cree community told residents to evacuate the area by today. Further south, there were evacuation orders for the second time in less than three weeks. 
A Montreal suburb is dropping the curtain on its traditional summer film screenings due to the province's language law. It has nothing to do with a, a decision that we've made. Uh, it, it is something that's being imposed uh, with Bill 96. To avoid a possible $30,000 fine under Quebec's new language legislation, Bill 96, the city is now cancelling all English screenings. About one-third of the city's residents are Anglophones. Ontario's Solicitor General is investigating how a Toronto rapper behind bars on first-degree murder charges managed to film a music video from inside his own jail cell. CTV Siobhan Morris has more in this report. Man, you want to know some facts? Believe it or not, this music video was filmed partially inside an Ontario jail cell. The man in orange is rapper Top 5, real name Hassan Ali. He's awaiting trial for first-degree murder. Two years ago, 20-year-old Hashim Omar Hashi was gunned down entering the parking garage at his Toronto apartment. Police say Hashi didn't appear to have any ties to crime. The music video is raising eyebrows from this former homicide detective. It's rather embarrassing for, uh, for, the, for the corrections people at, the, at that facility, but they'll be looking at it to try and find out uh, just how he got that in. In a statement, a spokesperson for Ontario Solicitor General writes in part, the ministry is aware of an unacceptable incident involving a video posted online that appears to contain images of secure areas of the Maplehurst Correctional Complex. The ministry has launched a full investigation into this incident and appropriate action will be taken. Mark Mendelson says contraband cell phones aren't uncommon and have a lot of value behind bars. But I can't think of uh, any particular time where somebody's actually gone out of their way in custody um, to film the video and then to have the audacity to publish it. The fact that Ali is in provincial prison before trial, not serving a sentence in a federal facility, might be a factor. In the provincial jails, there are scores of prisoners going in and out every day, so there's lots of prisoner transport. And that may be one of the ways that, uh, you know, that this item was smuggled in. Mendelssohn doesn't expect Ali's lawyer is too pleased with his cell block cell recording, but it's too soon to tell if it'll have any impact at his eventual trial. Siobhan Morris, CTV News, Toronto. Cursive writing is making a comeback in Ontario schools. The style of penmanship will return to the curriculum starting with third graders in September. It's part of a new language program to introduce several changes after a report from the province's Human Rights Commission revealed the education system was failing students. Still ahead, high hopes in the world of hoops. He's seven foot five, and at just 19 years old, he's already facing towering expectations. Basketball's next big star arrived in his new home city today to a hero's welcome. 19-year-old Victor Wembanyama has yet to play an NBA game, but already the expectations are off the charts. CTV's Bill Fortier has more. Welcome to the 2023 NBA Draft. There wasn't much mystery about how this was going to go. The San Antonio Spurs select Victor Wembanyama. Cheers in New York at the draft and celebration in San Antonio after Victor Webanyama went first overall. San Antonio is now Wimbanyama. I'm going to try and learn as quick as possible because I want to win that ring. At a reported 7 foot 5, it's not just his height that sets him apart. He's the first French player picked first in an NBA draft and is considered a generational talent, the most highly anticipated rookie since LeBron James. As he grows into his body, uh, the sky's the limit. The, shoot for Jones. the Spurs finished second last in the league last year, and while the coach may not appear as jubilant as the fans... I'm very excited. He insists he is. You don't want me to jump up and down, do you? put on a show for you. Here we go. The city of San Antonio quick to welcome its new superstar. Whimby, whimby, whimby. 
This 19-foot mural went up on the side of a seafood restaurant before he was even drafted. We heard this French guy was pretty good, so we thought we'd put him up for good luck. With all the hype, analysts say his biggest challenge in his rookie season might not be other players, but managing expectations. When asked about the pressure, Wemben Yama said, it's just basketball. Bill Fortier, CTV News, Edmonton. A pair of playground swings in the Edmonton area are having a life-changing impact. Beep, 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 beep. This is Harper Hankey's first time on a swing. The three-year-old has spinal muscular atrophy and uses a wheelchair. But this recently installed Liberty Swing allows Harper to soar as high as the other kids. It's like so exciting, especially as a mom, to come out and be like, we are now a part of the community. We are wanted out here. What are you? A the Liberty Swings are made in Australia and cost around $50,000 each. After the break, going for gold. Canadian athletes cleaning up and captivating audiences. Seven thousand athletes from 170 countries have descended on Berlin this week for the Special Olympics World Games, and Canadian competitors are proving their power with multiple trips to the podium. CTV's Heather Butts has more on some of our country's newest medal collectors. It's Canada in the lead for the first time. When it comes to the medal count, Canadian athletes are cleaning up. Three goes to one save for. That includes these power lifters. Oh, yeah. yeah. Showing off their hardware, we caught up with these special Olympians following a medal ceremony. They just finished cheering on Marley Gaylor. <laughs> Proud to be representing her country and sharing her passion for powerlifting. I like uh, meeting new people and socializing and having fun and lifting heavy weights. <laughs> <laughs> Jose Segun proving this is where she belongs. There was a sign that said powerlifting, and I went, and my dad was like, uh, no, you're not. And I was like, yeah, I am. So <laughs> fast forward to this day, here I am into my second World Games, and yeah, I have four gold medals on my neck. Known as the beast works out every day. There's no stopping David Nicholson. ISD's tried to lift today. Captivating audiences with their strength. And for some, their electrifying entrance. AKA downtown Phil Brown. At 55, Phil Brown's energy is infectious, and he makes deadlifting 375 pounds look easy. From New Minus, Nova Scotia, Brown has been eyeing the World Games for years. Been with Special Events 31 years. Last year, I found out on my 30th anniversary last year that I made Team Canada for Special Olympics, and no my head. I was in tears when I found out. Here I am. Living proof, don't give up. A powerhouse performance from this squad. This is the world's largest inclusive sports event. They're all unbelievable athletes, and I think it just helps to bring everybody one step closer to unified sports. And this week, they're putting it all in the spotlight for the world to see. Pro Canada! Heather Butts, CTV News, Toronto. That's it for us tonight. Heather Wright will be here tomorrow for Omar Sashidina and everyone at CTV National News. Thanks for watching. Good night.